idea that I will approve of you if. Right. You will earn my love if. And that's not what unconditional means. Unconditional means you get my love no matter who you are. What do you think are practical steps we can take in educating our sons or preparing our sons to be emotionally healthy adults? It's harder for men often to discriminate exactly what am I feeling. Uh, and then, uh, even once we do, it's harder to put that into words and actually express it. I've been sitting here all this time envious that you're drinking wine while I'm, you know, having a soda, but it's only two o'clock here, <laughs> so I can't. That's what I like to do with an I like to talk to a professor of an evening and get razzed on red wine. That's what I like to do. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Corey Floyd. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I want to thank you so much for for doing this show. I know that you're you're a busy man. You've you've got a lot on, and it's. I reached out to you in a sort of moment of need because for for a number of reasons. For I need help with uh, this book that I'm trying to write, and it goes hand in hand with a sort of actual existential crisis I'm having. So, and I, there was no one else on the earth I could call other than, than Corey Floyd. <laughs> you're a professor at the University of Arizona. At the uh, University right? of Arizona, that's right. And you know, when, I, when I read that about you, my first thought was a juvenile one. And I thought, I wonder if, do you ever just go, oh yeah, I'm a professor. Look at you. <laughs> Do you ever get used to being a professor? You know, I used to. I, I'm just way too old for that now. But um, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, I'm. I, I've almost, I've almost been a professor half my life now. Oh wow! So yeah, yeah I think you get to a point where uh, it's not quite so. It's not quite so earth shattering anymore. Because I would be shoehorning it just, into every single conversation. It's just who you are, and it's what you do, and uh, I I thoroughly enjoy it. I enjoy it as much now as I ever have. But um, yeah, the novelty of it is kind of worn off at this point. Uh, <laughs> that's cool. So I want to just sort of jump straight into why I need your help. Of course. I started to write a book, and the working title is "How to Love Your Son." And the point of the book I want to write is how can we sort of break these generational sins? And the original thinking was that tough times had bred tough men and those men had bred tough sons. And somewhere along the way, our ability to communicate our feelings uh, has got lost and our ability to be affectionate with our sons had got lost for a time. And I was hoping, and so I came across your article because I was under the impression that those things, the the affectionate bond between father and son that was a societal ailment that needed to be fixed but one of your articles that i read seemed to counter that a little bit by saying some fathers and sons they like doing diy together and that's their that's how they're affectionate yeah. so what what are your thoughts on fathers and sons i've got some specific questions here but just broadly um what is your thoughts on father and son's relationship because isn't it so common that dads and their sons struggle to be affectionate with one another. Yeah, no, it's very common. I don't think those two perspectives are mutually exclusive. The idea that uh, tough men breed tough sons and it's difficult to express affection and that fathers and sons also have this alternative language for letting each other know that they care about each other despite their difficulties in verbalizing feelings explicitly. Uh, in fact, I think that their difficulty in doing so is what gives rise to this more covert way of letting each other know we're okay, I care about you, you care about me. Um, that ability, I think, in many ways evolved out of necessity because men really do struggle uh, very often to put their feelings into words. Often um, it's, it's related to an inability to conceive of those feelings in the first place. Uh, so it can be rooted in an insecurity about what am I feeling to begin with? Uh, research tells us that compared to women, men make far fewer distinctions and discriminations in their 
sort of emotion palette, if you will. So uh, they may not distinguish, for instance, between um, attraction and infatuation and various other uh, instantiations of um, interest in someone else. They may simply call all of those things love, for example. Uh, I seem to remember falling into right. that trap as a teenager. <laughs> yes, un understood, understood, and, and many of us do. So it's harder for men often to discriminate exactly what am I feeling. Uh, and then, uh, even once we do, it's harder to put that into words and actually express it. Uh, and so I think out of necessity, though, men have turned to these more instrumental ways of showing affection to still convey the message. I still need to let my father know. I still need to let my son know that I care about him. So I'm going to do it in a way that sort of circumvents this need to put that into words. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. And that, that's, that is what sort of halted my sort of the, the writing of the book for a minute, because I actually hadn't considered that perspective. Although I still do, I still do sort of wonder if the emotional nourishment that a young boy or young man, so but my son is two years old. And that's ultimately where this all comes from is me figuring out how to how to be a father and how to love him properly uh, because sure. the only the template for love that i have is my mother's love which was exceptional but also almost too warm and safe and affectionate so i've been thinking a lot about what i would need in order for my son to grow up and have the necessary vocabulary and necessary social skills to properly convey his affection towards me towards people he loves and, and and that sort of thing so i'm just i'm I'm struggling with it because I, the best way to nourish that is to be affectionate with him and make that such a normal part of his day-to-day -day life i mean is that not a preferable way of doing it or is that just an alternative way of raising a son does that does that make sense no i i 100 agree uh that it's it's not just an alternative it's a preferable alternative right. uh it's it's dependent though on your own uh comfort in in engaging with him behaviorally in that way uh and that's where many many men fall short they want to raise sons who are um comfortable with affection who treat it as normative who uh who don't see it as an aberration at all uh but they themselves don't have that level of comfort and so in order to be able to uh model that for their sons they have to go through quite a behavioral transformation because yeah. you're really talking about modeling. You're really talking about showing him, not just telling him and not just instructing him, but showing him through your own behavior uh, what it means to treat father-son affection as, as normal, as normative, as, as desirable. And, um, and that relies on your own level of comfort uh, in doing that. Now, you may be uh, you may be well equipped, given your upbringing, uh, to do that. But many men are not, and so many men struggle with that, wanting to model that for their sons, but not really feeling that they have the wherewithal to do so. Man, and that strikes me as it's sad, doesn't it? I mean, I've got my my empathy is a sort of I've, I've got so much empathy that it's burdensome sometimes, and something like that makes me feel sad uh, the the point for, the reason for writing the book was i wonder if because i've got many many male friends and they've got children and i see the the spectrum or the affection spectrum we'll call it amongst these amongst mm -hmm. my friends and some are very open very affectionate with their kids and others are much more stoic and reserved the love is still very much there and very much raw um ignore my blurry cameras all falling apart <laughs> um the the affection is still there and they still love their kids but they're not very physically demonstrative of that and so i suppose the, the point of the book was to to wonder if we could teach a you know, the next generation of men that uh how to or give them some kind of template as to how to love their sons in a way which might be sociologically speaking much more beneficial to them because they because i just assume that they can have much healthier relationships if they're able to show affection from a young age uh if they're able to demonstrate how they feel um because we i've had i had to sort of 
learn it on the fly because I would just love everyone the way my mum loved me. And sometimes that's too much. You're giving yeah, too much affection, right. being, you know, and, it's, and it didn't sort of set me up, set me up properly. And I know a lot of your work has been in affection um, around that topic. Has there been anything that you've sort of discovered? Because I know I, I listened to a podcast you were on and you mentioned that you were yourself were an affectionate person. Was there anything in particular when you started studying affection that really stood out to you as a, wow, that's that's a really interesting um, thing. So what, what is it that got you into it in the first place? Many, many. And my my early epiphany was exactly the point that you just made, which is that uh, not everyone is as receptive to mm -hmm. it. Uh, as as you and I are, and I, I, I learned that at a very early age that uh, even though I valued affection greatly and still do, um, not everyone else does, and it's very easy to cross a line uh, and to be more affectionate with someone than the circumstance calls for, or even than the relationship itself calls for, and I found that very perplexing uh, because to me, affection is one of those things that. Uh, no matter how much I get, I always want more. And and yet many people find, uh, you know, find that quite off-putting. And, and I was very perplexed by that. The idea that there's a point of diminishing return, that there's a level at which uh, you are being so affectionate with someone that you're actually causing harm to the relationship, that you're actually making the person feel uncomfortable, uh, that you're making them feel imposed upon or violated that actually that actually can be a stressor yeah. uh, that was very counterintuitive to me i think of affection as a stress reliever not a stress inducer but you know and anyone who's had that experience of someone being a little too close to them showing them a little too much love a little too much touch being a little too in their personal space knows what i'm talking about that feels very stressful. And so I realized that inadvertently I had caused that feeling many, many times in my life toward other people. And I wanted to understand where that turning point was and why was it that there was a point at which affection actually became not just undesirable, but harmful. Mm. Uh, why was it sometimes good and sometimes bad? the very same behavior. Uh, and so it helped me to understand a lot of the nuances of affection once I started to study that in a scholarly way. But that was the big one for me. That was really a not a scholarly epiphany, but more of an interpersonal one sure. that led me to try to want to unravel that mystery once it became something that I studied. Yeah, that's it. And I find that, that I'm totally with you. That's really, really interesting. And I've had to learn that almost um, in a way myself with my previous partner was the complete opposite of me. She didn't like affection. She didn't like public displays of affection, which is fair enough, but she just wasn't an affectionate person. Um, but my partner now, she she is affectionate, not quite as affectionate as me, but she tolerates my affection much better and doesn't make her uncomfortable. Instead, it makes her feel sort of safe and love. So, but then I had to sort of wonder if where's my affection coming from? Is it coming from a place of I I constantly want you to know that yeah you know, I'm aware of your background, so I want you to know you're safe now. I love you. You're in a loving place. I'll do anything for you. It's an impulse to kiss her and hug her, or is it coming from a place of Please don't leave me. Look how much I love you. You know, so yeah, you have to try and yeah. find the the line. You know what I mean? There's a there's a concept in psychology called your attachment style, and this is your general orientation that we all have uh, toward relationships in our lives, and it's it's thought to develop in us as human beings in the very first days of our lives, based on the interaction we have with our primary caregiver, which is usually our mother, that's our first relationship in our life. And so the idea is that it imprints upon us this template of sorts. Um, so, so the level of affection and even the displays of affection, the way it's shown can be very similar, but the motivation behind it can be quite different. Yeah. So one person might be displaying affection out of a genuine desire to let the other person know how much they care about them. And the next guy can be doing the very same behaviors out of a out of a fear that he or she is going to be abandoned. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And that's uh 
that's that's really interesting. The thing, the thing about sort of having this conversation on a podcast is I'd I'd like a sort of minute or two to sort of absorb what you're saying, but I've got to keep the the chat. Of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> but that's really interesting because a lot of this is pertinent to me because I suppose my sort of self discovery has been a, a solo adventure. I've had to sort of figure out, especially since my son was born, I've had to really sort of get to the nub of why my why my behaviours were so impulsive growing up. And and one thing I want to talk to you about in particular was the the damage of say an absent father on what behaviors that teaches you going into relationships going forward because i i had no idea i thought i'd handled all this when i was a teenager i got in some fights i drank too much and i thought that was me processing my dad not not really caring but now at 30 i think because my son's about to turn two i've suddenly it, it matters now more than ever so what in your experience when it comes to father and son affection how important is it to the son's development like can you can you be without it but still flourish and does it take work i mean i've got no idea what does that look like yeah you know i would say to you that you you probably did process it before and you are processing it again now at a different developmental stage you know you're older now and you're a father yourself and the things that you need to figure out the things that you need to work through are different now than they were when you were a teenager. But you are noticing how the turmoil in your relationship with your own dad has continued to follow you. And that's a great example of what happens when parents writ large are absent in our lives. But in particular, when your same gender parent is absent in your life. Um, you know, you really are left in many ways without a guide for what it means in, in this case to be a male, you know, coming into your 30s, having a son of your own. What does this mean and how do you play this role in the way that our culture and our society expects? And, um, you know, we naturally, as children, turn to our same gender parent. We turn to that person um, as the um, as the prototype, if you will. Uh, I need to understand what it means to be a man. I turn to my dad. He's the he's the prototypical man in my life. Um, and when he's absent, then I'm looking for other father figures. I'm looking for other role models. For many young men, that can be uh, an uncle. It can be a grandfather. It can be an older brother. Uh, and so those men can serve a surrogate role. Not that they are replacing the father for that son, but they are providing a surrogate role model for what it means to develop as a man, for better or worse. They're not necessarily positive role models, but they are providing a model of sorts. Uh, when men lack that entirely during their development, um, then they really do come into their own adulthood, their own manhood, with a great deal of uncertainty. Um, and they may not realize, as, as you may not have realized, even coming into their own adulthood, that they had not resolved those tensions. And so you're just going about it differently now because the things you have to resolve and understand in your own mind are different now than they were when you were an adolescent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I suppose we're we're shedding the skin of our former selves regularly. And especially if you throw in a, a child, a fiance now. And I suppose sure. the, the big one for me is having to be responsible for someone else. I'm used to living a very, very selfish, very decadent, very self, you know, I was, I spent most of my life sort of traveling around Europe backpacking and, and just the only person I ever had to worry about was myself. Right. But now I've got this unconditional love that is staggering. It's just the best thing in the world, that love, but and also terrifying. And somewhere in the, the meld of those fears and those joys, I've had to sort of figure out I guess what sort of father I want to be and what kind of man I'm going to be. Um, and I just want to steer him to be, if, if the only thing he ever learns from me is the vocabulary to be able to explain that he's sad, that he's happy, that he's 
feeling full of love and that you know those if he learns those things from me then that'll be a job well done because that makes that'll make him better than me and me i'm better than my father do you know and absolutely the best way that you can teach him that is through modeling is not to try to teach it to him directly through instruction but to model it for him mm. so that as he looks to you as the prototypical man in his life he sees someone who is in touch with his emotions, who is not afraid to express them, who's not afraid even to admit the sort of tender, vulnerable emotions like being afraid or being sad, um, and sees that when he does that, it is met with acceptance, it is met with approval, it is not met with this message of that's not what boys do or man up and stop being a wuss, stop being emotional. That's what girls do. So many men grow up with those messages, yeah. implicitly or explicitly. So if he sees you modeling, you know, in, in many ways, Steve, you have to be the man that you want him to be. Mm -hmm. Because he yeah. will see that in you. He yeah. will see that in you yeah and that's and that's lovely and i'm and i'm aware of that and so i try and treat uh like his mother my fiance for example i want him to see a couple that are openly in love and openly are able to communicate so i mean he's only two but i said to my, my fiance that these habits are really good to get into now so yeah, absolutely uh, watch them yeah. so and it, again it makes me think about though these these boys i mean there's enough i guess it might be based on where you live but in our hometown there are so many kids that either don't have fathers or they only see their fathers every couple of weeks out of weekend um and one i can never get my head around why you how you can be away from your 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 baby for so long it's just i, I can't quite i've never been able to, to fathom it uh, fathom it but also i think that that that's what i want to help is i want to go okay so your father wasn't there how do you now do, build yourself into something that your son or your daughter even is, is going to want to be. And I wonder at the effect that fatherless sons is going to have on the, the next generation, because what, what I suppose I'm just sort of thinking out loud. We, we talk about a generation, let's say a post-war generation, which was tough and it raised tough sons. But at the very least, there was, uh, you could argue that the, the fathers were there in presence. But we seem to have a generation where the it's softer but the fathers aren't there. So I'm trying to, you know, which is the more damaging. I'm like, so, I mean, uh, so I don't know. I find this whole thing very sort of confusing, to be honest. I've never had to think this this hard about what sort of, what fatherhood means. Uh, but the things you're thinking about are are good to be thinking about. And and one of those, you know, I, I don't know what it what it's like in your in your town or what the opportunities are, but one of those may be for you to consider how, uh, as your son grows up and as he makes friends and, and has peers of his own who are lacking good relationships with their own fathers or are lacking good role models, um, is there an opportunity for you to step in and be that surrogate prototypical man? Sure. There's so much that you can do to circumvent the problems that their own father's absence is going to end up having on their lives. Yeah. If you can be that uh, sort of coach figure or older brother figure, or this is my best friend's father and isn't he great kind of figure, you can be that person who shows them a very positive representation of masculinity, uh, then you're going to have the ability to influence not only your own son's development, but the ripple effect uh, of being a positive role model for any number of his peers. And that's a, you know, what a lovely thing to have happen. Yeah, man, that's great. That's a really, really, that's a really lovely idea. Um, and I suppose it's the, the problem with where we are here is it's a very, it's a hardworking town, very sort of working class. Um, and it's, it's tough. Uh, the lessons we learn early on in school in particular, and what I learned in school are you had to be tough if you that your your place on that sort of social hierarchy in school 
meant that you know if you if you were high up then the girls would spend time with you the other tough kids would spend time with you people wouldn't pick fights with you because of who you were with association you know who you associated with the other cool kids and the boxers and so we learned very early on that being tough is important in this town and it goes on in the school sort to this day so that's those are the lessons i learned early and those were harmful because that we prioritized the very wrong parts of human nature and that's that exemplifies what this town is and that's what i'm hoping to give my because i got swept up in it so I, it mattered to me there was nothing more important than being tough or than being someone that the girls wanted to spend time with and that negatively affected my personality way up into my 20s perhaps it took me a long time to undo that so i think i suppose part of my goal is to be able to teach kids that a different set of priorities and what what really matters is is them their development their growth their self-awareness their their progression does, does that make sense it absolutely does because in many ways i grew up in that town too um and uh, i i think for the most part i was able to um circumvent a lot of those lessons i did not take on the persona of having to be tough and and falling in line with what was valued in that town because I had a very strong sense of self back then, even at that early age, that um, that that was that was not the persona that I identified with, and and I didn't want to, and so I wasn't going to. Um, I was I, I wouldn't say immune to peer pressure. I still cared very much what other people thought of me. But I did not let it affect my behavior uh, nearly as much as as many of my peers did. I think because I could see beyond it. I could see that this was what was valued in the social system at the time. But I could I could already see that we were going to outgrow this eventually. And that what's cool now is not going to be cool in 10 years. It's not going to be cool if you're sort of a a buff idiot who doesn't care about, you know, speaking in complete sentences. <laughs> um, you know, that that matters now. It's not going to matter in 10 years when sure. you need to have a job and when people are going to start forming relationships that are based on things other than your bravado. Um, you know, I wasn't thinking about it in those terms at the time. But I think I could see that this social system was not sustainable. Um, and so I kept telling myself that uh, I'm only, I only have to live in this set of rules in this social structure for right now. Yeah, that's, once, that's I, once I finish school, um, I will be out of school. I will be in a situation in which I have a lot more control over the social system that I want to be in. You know, do I go to way, go away to college? Do I stay in my town? You know, what are my choices going to be? But I have choices. I have options. This does not define my entire life. And I think that's a message that you can give children that um, this is just the, the set of rules. This is the social structure you're in right now. It's not always going to be this way. And if you don't want to subscribe to this set of rules, you know, you can develop a sense of self that allows you not to have to subscribe to the set. You can say, I'm just going to abide this right now, but recognize that in 10 years, in five years, however many years until I'm, I'm finished with school, um, that's all I have to do. I just have to abide it and then I'm, and then I'm done with this. And then a very different set of, of skills and abilities and attributes is going to be valued in me. I can go somewhere where my intellect is valued. I can go somewhere where my empathy is valued. Not my physical strength, not my bravado, not my um, you know, ability to hold my own in a fight but my ability to hold my own in an intellectual debate, for example, my ability to commit in a relationship, to develop a relationship that isn't based on physical attraction alone. Um, you know, the things that sort of characterize us as adults compared to what characterizes us as children. 
Uh, and I guess I, for whatever reason, I was able to see over the hillside and recognize that I was just in, that this wasn't going to be my whole life. I was just in that, that social structure for the time being. That worked out okay for young Corey. It didn't really it? did. It? Yeah, it really did. And, you know, not that I want to bash my hometown or the people I grew up with, but uh, I tell you what, those kids who were voted most popular in my class uh, certainly have not had the most successful lives, relatively speaking. So um, it's a good lesson that popularity is really uh, bound to the particular time and place and um, and level of, of of maturity that it represents at the time. Sure. And uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, as much as I might have envied their popularity at the time, I certainly do not envy where that popularity uh, took them, what it got them in yeah, life. That's, a, that's an empty. You know currency. what I mean? Yeah, that's yeah. the emptiest currency there is, isn't there? At that age. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> so I suppose Corey Wass, I've I've got you here. And by the way, that that description of when you're talking about your your childhood um i thought man that's that's great and i i hope to impose that in my son where i because I, I remember my mum trying to say to me it's only temporary it's only temporary don't get too wrapped up in these emotions and relationships because it's not gonna last forever and i wasn't as i didn't have the prescience you had i i was totally wrapped up in in girls and fighting and it just you know it was terrible so that that was good what you said i'm, I'm gonna sort of consider that as one of the sort of key tenets of raising a, a boy to teenagehood and, and adulthood i think so what do you think are practical steps we can take in educating our sons or preparing our sons to be emotionally healthy adults? Well, like I said before, I, I think the most important element by far is modeling that behavior yourselves. Uh, you know, you and your fiance and any other adults that, you know, have a, a significant role in his life. Um, kids are very attuned to the message, whether it's implicit or explicit, of do as I say, not as I do. They're very attuned to that and, and very wise to that. And they will not do as you say and not as you do. They're going to do as you do. <laughs> yeah. Modeling is, you know, we've shown it, you know, over and over to begin the, to be the most powerful uh, form of learning, form of teaching. Um, and so it is important what you do, not just what you teach him to do. So he needs to see in you the man that you want him to grow up to be as far as that exists within your own capabilities. Now, I think many, I say that because many people would stress that they they want their children to be better than they are, to be uh, more accomplished or more intellectual or more empathic, whatever it is that, that, that they value. And so they don't want them to just be limited to a mini version of myself. And, and while I can understand that, uh, that doesn't negate the importance of being the best version of you that you have the capability to be. You need to, you need to go as far as you can to model for him things like empathy, um, self-awareness, politeness, commitment in relationships, um, all of the qualities that, uh, that you may want him to go further than you on, but he's not gonna go further if he doesn't at least develop to the level that you can generate for yourself. Um, so I think it's important to model those things. And I also think it's really valuable for him to hear you talking about why they are important. So for instance, when you see um, a positive behavior in another child, let's say, or even in another grown adult, that you hear your son say, wasn't that a great thing that that, that man just did? Wasn't that great the way he uh, comforted his son, for example, when he was uh, when he was feeling bad? Um, to hear you praising behavior, even if it's behavior in other people, 
I still have many memories of my parents, um, the things that they praised and the things that they criticized in other people's behavior within earshot of me. I think sometimes they did it intentionally. Often they just did it and I happened to hear it. But those kinds of messages are really profound. They can have a really long lasting impact. Um, I remember what my parents praised and what they condemned. And so you and your and your fiance both, uh, that would be something for you to talk about and get on the same page with the importance of being consistent in what you are praising and what you are criticizing within his earshot. That's yeah, that's lovely. That's a really good idea. And I suppose actually that that if I think of examples of that in my own childhood a lot of those things are negative right because it's it's clumsy adults in my presence making fun of someone for some reason or right. being disrespectful or even being racist because that, that they assumed it was okay because they're talking to their friends but actually i'm overhearing it um right. so those things stain don't they they're difficult to uh so yeah so, so for example there uh you and your son are in your town and you hear someone make a racist comment it's important for your son not to hear silence from you. Right. It's yeah. important for your son to hear something like, you know, that really wasn't very polite of him to say, or it's, you know, really people should not be making fun of other people because of their race or because of their disability or something like that. Something that will stick with him as when you saw or when you heard that behavior, uh, there was what he heard from you was an exception. What he heard from you was a condemnation of that and not silence because he'll interpret that silence as acquiescence as got it um, you know as you you heard that and you didn't say anything against it so it must be okay and he will internalize that acquiescence he will internalize that implicit approval from you in many ways that will be more influential to him than the behavior itself how did you react? I mean, you know already, even with a two-year-old, often children look to their parents to gauge their parents' reactions mm -hmm. to something that has occurred. And that gives them information. As young children, it gives them information about whether that um, happening is a threat. So do, do the parents react to it with distress or do they? does it seem to be no big deal? That teaches the young child how to react. But as they grow up, that same pattern repeats itself uh, as they are developing their moral compass, as they're developing their social ideas about what's acceptable and not. They're still going to look to their parents' reaction. Yeah. How does the parent respond to that behavior? Because the way they respond implicitly is the way I should respond. That's the message they'll get. That's, that's brilliant. That's a really good point, and that's something I'll uh, I'll I'll add to uh, my notes for this book because I think that's lovely. That's a really good point, and also he's at the stage where he's mimicking, which is of lovely, course, yeah, and it's amazing, and he's mimicking our speech. But every now and then, it's kind of terrifying for you. <laughs> Mate, yeah. yeah, the other day I was uh, I was helping him with his jacket, and I forget that he sort of can speak a few words now. And I was helping him with his jacket, and I realised I'd done the jacket up wrong, and I went oh, bollocks, and he went. Uh, bollocks. I went, oh no, <laughs> don't tell your mother. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of kind of out me. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, the, but that was a, a really good example of, um, man, he's absorbing everything. It's all going in. It's all, he's drinking it all in. Um, what do you make of the need for, because part of me thinks it would be wise to early on get him in some kind of you know, martial art or something, because whilst we want him to be, you know, emotionally vulnerable. We want him to be totally okay with his feelings and stuff like that. There is some aspect where you go, man, the, the world as we know it is, is chaotic and we don't know which way it's going to swing. We, uh, we don't know what the, the politics of tomorrow will be. So there is, do you think there is some wisdom in thinking there needs to be some element of preparedness? Uh, just not, not for like, I'm not talking about war or conflict, but I mean, just so that because martial arts obviously gives you great, um, self-confidence and, and all, all that sort of stuff but also maybe it is important that there is a 
whereas before fathers made their sons tough by being sort of cold or being much harsher than I want to be, perhaps we can do it in a more controlled environment. Do you know what I mean? And teach them some kind of martial Yeah, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. I remember often as a young boy wishing that I knew um, some martial arts or something to be able to defend myself. It's not street fighting where the idea is just to go in and do as much damage. There's, there's, a, there's a really strong ethic that goes along with martial arts. And, and he would, uh, I think, really benefit from that every bit as much as learning the technical skill. Um, and, you know, paradoxically, if people know that he has that skill, he may be less likely to have to use it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. my thinking. It's more of a, just a card you can play. In many ways, yeah, yes. I get that. Yeah, I guess. and I guess the other thing is to be careful of my expectations for him because at some point he's going to veer away from you know the the the, the way I carefully plot his life. I'm being I'm not like that. I'm very careful to I'll be very careful to make sure he turns into the sort of man he wants to be as well. Um, but I part of me thinks, man, it'd be nice if he had my my mind but with an education because there's all the curiosity in the world but no education so i, I would like for him to have you know be educated but i don't you know I, what? I don't want to force I, it. Yeah. I i've come to the realization that it's it's absolutely okay for fathers to have their desires for their sons to have their expectations for their kids uh and also he's going to be the man he's going to be. And, um, and that will be in, uh, that will be in large part um, because he has internalized or will have internalized the message from you that even though I have my ways that I'd like you to grow up and ways I'd like you to be and things I would love for you to be able to do, it is also really important to me, I'm speaking as you right now, to him, that you know that um, you're okay with me, whoever you end up being. Um, I, uh, I, I, I got a very strong, I got that, that message very strongly from my own dad, who, when I was an adolescent, um, really, really wanted me to play basketball like he had played. I was a skinny nerd who had almost no athletic ability or coordination whatsoever. <laughs> so my very first day in youth basketball, um, I think my dad had the epiphany that this was not going to happen for me. <laughs> I just was not going to be a basketball player. No matter how much he wanted it for me, it was absolutely okay with me growing up to be whoever I was going to be. And, and it was because I knew that, that I had the ability to do that. And I didn't feel like, well, I better stay in basketball or else my dad's not going to love me. Right. And I hope you don't mind me asking, but how do you reflect on the, because that sounds lovely, isn't it? but how do you reflect on your father's love now that you're an independent, accomplished, successful adult? Like how much of a, how much of an impact did it have on you and, and who you've become now? You know, it, a much bigger impact than I would have understood earlier in my life. And I think as you get older and as you get more reflective, you recognize that, um, yeah, it is a lot of what you did, but but there is also a really strong influence of, uh, I think, the messages that you grew up with, and uh, and and more than anything, you know, my my dad's a wonderful person, and he's very affectionate with me, always has been. Um, I really really appreciate that, and and I have a you know I have a lot of qualities that that he has in droves. So I, I don't mean to give the impression that he's only a basketball player. And if we didn't connect that way, we have no way of connecting. We have a lot of ways of connecting, but what I appreciate the most about the way he raised me, at least at this point in my life, were the messages that he raised me with. And there were two that resonated with me more than any other. Uh, and they had different meaning to me over the course of my life. I mean, at different stages, they meant different things to me. But one of those was you can be whatever you want to be in life. And the other of those was, and I will love you just the same, 
no matter who or what you end up being as a, as a human being. Um, and that gave me the freedom to, for example, tell myself, I don't have to play basketball in order for my dad to love me or in order for him to spend time with me or in order for him to care about me. He's going to love me and spend time with me and care about me no matter what I pursue. And basketball, I mean, athletics writ large, is just not my thing. Um, I mean, I, I not only did I not want to do it, Steve, I had I had so little ability to do it that even if it had been my desire, I mean, I just was terrible. I had no innate ability whatsoever, yeah. you know, and add in an absolute lack of interest. Um, <laughs> but I never had to fear that if I don't do those things, my dad won't love me. Yeah. I had I had classmates for whom I think that was probably a very real concern. I, if I, I don't do this thing, my dad's not going to approve of me. He's not going to love me. He's not going to spend time with me. He's not going to care about me as much. Um, I had a I had a friend growing up, a classmate, who told me that his dad told him that the reason his dad and mother had a younger son is because he had turned out to be such a disappointment. Oh, geez. told him that. Christ. So he had to live with that. That wasn't implicit. <sighs> So those messages that I can do whatever I want and I will have my parents love no matter what, um, those gave me an enormous sense of self-efficacy, an enormous sense that I don't have to follow the crowd. Um, it was how I was able to get through school in that town, realizing that I didn't have to do what all the other boys were doing, um, that I had a very secure footing at home um, in a way that I think many of my classmates did not. And I could just go my own route. I could go my own direction, whatever that was. And I was always going to have support. And, um, you know, that didn't mean that every single thing I did met with approval. I mean, I still made mistakes. I still did things that my dad didn't approve of or things that garnered punishment, but they weren't about who I was. They were just about my behavior in that moment. Right. You know, did I lie to him about this or, you know, did I stay out too late or did I, did I break the rules? Yeah, I did all of those things. Kids do that. Um, but that's about your behavior. It's not about who you are. And it's not about your father telling you that he doesn't approve of who you are. It's really important, I think, to separate. I'm not approving of your behavior in this moment from, I just, I don't accept you. I don't approve of who you are. No son of mine is going to, you know, fill in the blank whatever it might be. No son of mine is going to do ballet. No son of mine is going to like reading. No son of mine is going to be gay. No son of mine, you know, fill in the blank. Yeah. A lot of kids, a lot of boys we grew up with heard messages like that. Yeah. And I wonder if I don't harbor some resentment for, for that reason, because I was a very, very gentle boy very gentle and I was right up until school a very very loving very quiet um and then when my when I finally met my father when I was 12 or 13 which is sort of very formative years it was pre-teenage mm -hmm. years yeah. he was big he was rough he was tattooed he had always had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth it's no coincidence that by the time I hit 15 I'd scarred my body in tattoos started smoking and just wanted to and started to model myself in this guy who I didn't even really like but but he was yeah. just he was but I, I noticed that people responded to him with a sort of reverence because of his size and because of his energy and his power and so I started to I went off course from what I otherwise might have been, which is a, the model of my mother and became a very unfortunate model of my father. And so, and, and I, but luckily I've managed to 
curb it back and get back on track so um and i, I really appreciate you, you you sharing all that with me that's really that's given me a lot to to think about um, yeah you know I, I think that obviously we continue to develop as adults um you know we used to think that development sort of ended when you when you entered adulthood at that point you had become whoever you're going to be and your process development was you realize development lifelong process and you know, and i'm not at all the same person i was when i was 20 30 even 40 i'm 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 different now i'm continuing to develop and so and 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 so will you you know um so in many ways, Floyd, you're going to Floyd, go Floyd, through... If you tell me you're older than 40 years of age, I'm going to immediately go and get a skincare routine. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm 54. Um, Corey, you look and, marvelous. No, and it really is true. I mean, I really, I, I really am. I, I really am different than I was at 30 or 40. Um, and and so the point is that you're going to go through development alongside your son you're going to develop just as he does and i didn't recognize that when i was a child of course you don't think of your own father as still developing into the person that he's going to become you think of him as um sort of set and stable and 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 and, right. and, and kind of set in stone uh but he isn't he isn't and and you're not and and i'm not um, we will continue to develop through the course of our lives. And um, I think it is valuable to, um, to point out to your son that, uh, that you're okay with that, that you still make mistakes. And that, you know, it, mistakes are okay to make, that we all make them. And, uh, and that we all learn from them. And that, you know, when when you make a mistake, it's it's really valuable, I think, for your son to be able to see you recognize that, acknowledge that, make amends for that. Let him see you apologize to other people. Let him see you be in that vulnerable position. That's going to normalize those things for him. He's going to recognize that it's okay to be imperfect. It's okay to continue to be learning through our lives. It's okay that we're all still developing into the people that we're going to be. Uh, these are just among the many things that you, by modeling them for him in a mindful way, uh, can help him to absorb, can help him to absorb those lessons. Um, and so that he's not afraid of being who he is. He's going to discover who he is, and and you want him to be okay with that. You want him to embrace that, and not be afraid of that, and not believe like it sounded like you believed earlier on that I have to be like this person because I feel like their approval is contingent mm. on doing that. Yeah, you know, you may not have recognized that when you met your dad, but my belief is that you internalized a message that his approval matters to me and it's contingent mm. i have to do these things i have to be these That's right. things i have to earn it in other words you know we talk about unconditional love but um but so many of us in practice we model conditional love we model the idea that i will approve of you if Right. You will earn my love if, and that's not what unconditional means. Unconditional means you get my love no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. And so we have to decide for ourselves and not just as parents, um, as friends, as teachers, as employees uh, or supervisors, no matter what social roles we embody, we have to decide for ourselves, is my love and approval going to be unconditional am i going to practice that or you know am i going to be one of those person one of those persons who doles out approval conditionally who makes other people earn it hmm. like those fathers who say you better be a jock or 
I have no interest in you. Like those fathers who say, we had your younger brother because you turned out to be such a disappointment. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Well, listen, you've you've given me a lot to chew on. So. I'm sure all of this makes fatherhood seem like a piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, entirely uncomplicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's just that it, it, I knew going in, I knew what I was, I knew what I signed up for, but that's why I wanted to work hard at making sure I didn't make a mess of it. You know what I mean? I, I wanted to make sure I was, I was. Well, I'm, and I so you know, applaud you for that, just for that mindfulness. Number one. Um, but also for sharing your story. I mean, for sharing your story on your podcast and in your book and being a model to other fathers of normalizing these concerns, these these moments of self-doubt and using them instead of sort of wallowing in your fear and saying, oh God, fatherhood is so scary. You know, you're using it and saying, all right, here are some things I need to figure out. Here are some things I need to work through. I need to understand these better. I'm not going to be paralyzed by my fear. I'm going to let my fear motivate me to get some perspective on these things, to work through them. You're modeling that for other dads. Yeah. And that's also super valuable. Yeah, I hope so. And I hope I can continue. I hope I can get the book written in a way that is is uh applicable to to fathers whatever they want to do whether it's just they Absolutely. want to relate yeah. better to or or, or even because i suppose a lot of my my journey in fatherhood was understanding myself better and then i was able to become a better father because i understood my own of you know, course fears and ambitions and that sort of thing so um but i've 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 loved talking to you and uh it's been it's been a real real privilege so thank you so much for being on the the steve kayla show <laughs> It's been a privilege for me as well. I really appreciate it and uh, happy to visit with you anytime.